outline of this session is asking ourselves, are cyber attacks reality or is it just a fiction? What security is all about? And then what are the goals of security? And then there are some fundamental concepts related to security, which you really need to be familiar with. Uh, in, you know, in any domain, you have to know the terminology of the domain. When you talk to professionals, they will be throwing at you these terms. You really need to be familiar with them. Plus, we will be using them along the course. So it's important to really uh, have a good understanding what they really mean. So is cyber attacks and cyber security a reality or is it just a fiction? What do you think? Yeah. Why, why is that? Well, how can you prove it? <clears throat> very good. Yes, very good. We see this every month, every week, every few days. We hear a lot of... Uh, Lots of incidents, lots of security breaches, lots of uh, security incidents, even with the big guys. You know, if you go to this URL, uh, you will be surprised how much, for example, data leakage from many companies, millions of records of uh, user accounts or e emails or password has been leaked or has been uh, hacked. And, and this is all the time happening. And the People are doing it, or the attackers are doing it for various reasons. Sometimes for political reasons, like what happened with the Qatar News Agency and, and what they try to kind of find a pretext or find some kind of uh, cover-up for their agenda, and they basically attack the news agency and put some fake news. So it could be political, it could be for financial gain, like stealing uh, account information or stealing uh, bank account details for identity thefts or for financial theft. It could be also, this is not only small hackers, sometimes uh, professional hackers and, pro and even government agencies could be behind this, these attacks. So attacks and cybersecurity threats are a reality and we hear about them all the time. Uh, if you think it's only affecting somewhere else, not this region, uh, then you need to think twice because even this region is under a lot of attacks. Uh, there are some regional attacks. Even QNB in 2016 has suffered a big breach uh, and some data leakage. So this motivates the need and this mo also explains the growth of this area. There's a lot of... Uh, opportunities in this area because of the number and sophistication of attacks increasing every day. So what is security? The sec second question, first question is, is it a reality, these cyber attacks? It is, and uh, the examples I gave you are evidence of this. Second question, which comes to mind, is what security is. It is Usually, in general, in general, security is protection from harm. That's what security really is. Uh, whether in the physical world or in the, uh, on the, compu in the computer or cyber, cyber world, cyber, in both, we try to protect from harm. So, for example, in simple scenario in our homes, we use security mechanism like locks, for example, and before we leave, we lock our door, not to allow strangers or to come in and cause any harm, okay? In a case of a, a much more critical organization or infrastructure, locks are not enough. You will find the organizations putting fences around their premises, uh, putting cameras, putting uh, security guys, protecting the area. So depending on the value of the asset, we might invest even in more security mechanisms. So. So in one word, security is all about protection from harm. In the context of computer security, this is, these are the common harms that we find in real world. It could be either theft of information, and this information could be corporate secrets, like uh, let's say the design of a new product. The, these thefts try to steal this design and maybe uh, go to markets before the company. 
or they, it could be personal information like or financial information. It could be military intelli intelligence. So these are the harm. The, this is one category of harm. The second category is alteration of information. So in the case of uh, Qatar News Agency, there was an alteration of information. So they hacked into the website and posted some fake news. So. Or they could go, sometimes hackers, they go to a website and then they put some inappropriate content or some politically motivated content just to damage the reputation of that organization or, or, gain, or for some political gains. Or somebody can go, with, even within the organization, they have done some fraud or some misconduct and they can try to go to a database and try to delete some record or change some record to cover up their fraud or their... Uh, or their misconduct. Or sometimes it could be denial of service, where this is very common, where attacker generate a lot of traffic to a particular service to the extent that that service becomes unavailable and not being able to serve genuine requests. It is busy uh, serving attackers rather than genuine users. So you, we can kind of categorize these uh, harms that can be inflected onto uh, computer systems in, th in, this, in these three categories, uh, theft of information, alteration, and denial of service. So, and the security in the computer world, we can borrow a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts from the real world. Except in the real world, we are protecting physical stuff like money, jewelry, cars. Um, you know, even in cars, we might put alarm, we might put some security mechanism to protect it. Um, basically, we are trying to protect some assets that we value. Um, so, and we are comfortable and we feel secure if we have some confidence that nobody is able to harm this asset, nobody's is able to misuse it, and nobody is able to use it without our permission. Then we feel it is secure. So similarly, similar in the real world, the way we care about security, when it comes to the real, when it comes to the computer world, we care about assets in the computer system. Especially the most important asset <coughs> is the actual data. We're trying to protect the data. At the end of the day, that's the major the most important valuable assets in the in the computing context contest context sorry um, so what we're trying to do here we try to protect the data but it is it is hard it is harder than even the physical world because data is spread everywhere in many uh, computing devices from PCs to laptops to online services um, plus, it is electronically accessed, and it's this is made even harder with the internet. So, when when the internet came along, uh, computer security became much much harder because not only you can be uh, harmed by some people who can who who can come in physically to your premises or some internal attacker. It could be remotely people can attack your system and can cause harm to your system. So it's much harder than physical security. Okay, so, so we talked about these attackers. These are many, many types of attackers. Uh, just some uh, little kids that they find some tools out there and some scripts and they try to have a fun and cause some harm. Somehow, there are some scammers, there are uh, cyber, cyber spies, it could be insiders, somebody unsatisfied, some employee that has been laid off, they could uh, decide to, to do some attack to cause harm. It could be security hacktivism, which are like, uh, they, they don't like, let's say, globalization, or they don't like certain government decision, they can... Go, go and do some uh, attacks as a way of protesting. Um, there is also crime. Of course, there is a big networks uh, out there, cyber mafia, and there are secret agencies and government agencies also active in the, uh, in the area of attacks. And of course, there is a, a whole economy, underground economy based on cyber crime. 
you can there are organizations you can pay them and they you tell them what they do and they can go and cause harm. Uh, and if those of you who've seen like um, for example the attack on Qatar news agency, lots of um, underground cyber organizations has been also been contributing to it. So okay, so this is briefly what security is all about is protecting our systems from harm. Now what are to summarize in, in a very nice way the main goals of security, we have these three main goals. I've discussed them last time, I'll go through them very briefly. We have confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So security is not like some uh, fluffy term that is, doesn't have very concrete meaning. In here it has very, very concrete meaning in the sense that at the end of the day, you're trying to protect these three properties. Confidentiality. What do we mean here by confidentiality? Stop where it's important to introduce Like you only know about its content. Very good. Yes. So you don't allow unauthorized users to have access or to read confidential data. So it's all about like stopping unauthorized users from reading. What about integrity? You have to change the not change the, the the unauthorized users should not be able to change some data for example in a case of websites unauthorized users should not be able to change pages or post new content or if if you are not an administrator you're not supposed to change the system configuration okay so and the last one is the the third uh, goal of security is to preserve availability what do we mean here by availability? For example, make the server available under attack. Yes, basically protect our, our, our systems and our servers against attack to make sure they are always available to legitimate users to use them. So whenever you want to access, let's say, a Blackboard or Banner to get your transcripts or your schedule, Banner should be available. Uh, for you. So this is the goal. These are the three goals of security, and they are also known as CIA, C C I A triad. C I A triad. C stands for confidentiality, I for integrity, and A for availability. Okay. So and this is what I we just defined. So confidentiality is all about preventing unauthorized reading of confidential data. Integrity is preventing unauthorized or malicious modifications. And availability is making sure that the data is available to authorized users and making sure that the systems remain operational, reachable, and functional and available to legitimate users. These are the three goals of security. Now, how to achieve these goals the first thing you really need to do is to understand the adversary, understand how the attackers, how the attacks are mounted, understand the, the potential attackers, understand what are, for the attackers, what resources they have, what motive, why people would, would think to come and, and, attack, and attack your system. You really need to have a good understanding of that. Understanding what are the ways what are the ways uh, these attackers can come and harm your system? What are the vulnerabilities in your system that, uh, that will enable them to come and harm your system? And you really need to understand uh, basically the attacker and their motivation, what mechanisms they use to mount these attacks, what are the vulnerabilities in your system that enables them to, to do those, those attacks. Once you do all of this, then you can decide what are the mechanisms, the control mechanisms to protect your system. Of course, this is what this course is all about. We will go through some of these aspects. Okay? Uh, so first, let's just talk a little bit about the adversary. The adversary is basically the attackers. Here, we have two types of adversary. 
So some attack scenarios, the adversary is active. In other scenarios, the adversary is passive. Active means they are doing something, taking part of the attack. They could be, for example, corrupting transmitted messages. This is an active attack. Uh, preventing ongoing communication, like, uh, or injecting a virus in the system. These are active attacks. Another type of attacks are passive attacks. You don't really see their impact. They are just hiding there. And usually, like listening on communication links, uh, taking copies and logging transmitted messages. So this is more kind of stealing information and sometimes learning about your system. They could be there for a long time. They don't do any action. They are just there. They, they monitor the traffic. They try to identify important assets within your organization. And then at a certain stage, they might turn and do some active attacks. So it could be two stages, or sometimes their goal is just to maybe to steal some information. Once they find what they want, they leave you alone. They don't do any damage. But they are, the damage they do is stealing the, the valuable information from your system. Or it could be both. Uh, they steal some information, um, and they can start causing some uh, harm to your system. Maybe deleting some important files, putting viruses in your system, doing denial of service attacks, and so on. So you, we need to be aware of these two types of adversary, passive and active. And they can, and they can change this, this kind of attitude from passive to active as they wish. And there is a, a type of attack called uh, advanced persistent threats, advanced persistent threats, where the attacker is first passive, spend some time in, within your organization trying to learn your network architecture, try to learn what are the most valuable assets and servers and applications and so on. Once they learn, then they start becoming active um, to cause further harm. Okay, so this is just a, an example uh, attack scenario, for example, that is very common uh, to, ha to, to compromise availability, which is known as denial of service attack. We will see this, of course, in more details in this course. In this course, we will see some tools to, to do this and some mechanisms to prevent it. But, you know, this is an introduction lecture just to give you the big picture of the whole area. So denial of service is basically overwhelming the online and an online service with many, many requests to the extent that it becomes unavailable. Um, so in here, this is a scenario of a even, even more dangerous scenario, which is known as distributed denial of service attack. So what we have here, we have the attacker. The attacker controls a lot of malicious software installed in many computers around the world. And it controls these computers. At certain stage, it tells them, here is your target. Go ahead and create so many requests to this target uh, service. And then this victim service will basically become overwhelmed and maybe crash and become, or maybe too, becomes too slow. Are these like, uh, because zombies, are they all like fake? No, not, not fakes. For example, uh, you know, sometimes people download some malicious software, uh, illegal software, or maybe they visit some malicious websites and they, some Trojan, Trojan or some virus or some uh, malware get installed with this illegal software, for example. So these people are enjoying that software, but at the same time, it has an embedded, uh, an embedded piece of software that, is, that, that the attacker has control over through the internet. And it can ask at any time, let's say an attacker has thousands or even millions of, of copies of this mal malware spread all over the world, and it can ask, go ahead and create a request, let's say, to uh, aljazeera.com. Oh, of course, without the people knowing, yes. Yes, without the people knowing. Uh, basically, these uh, malware, they are not intending to harm your, your system as such. Sometimes, depending on the scenario, they, they, use, they misuse your system to mount 
a distributed of denial of attack. There is a there is a denial of service attack, which is which is much simpler. Just from one computer, you start sending so many requests to another server. But that one is easy to detect and, and, and fix. Because on the server side, there is something called firewall. It can detect that there are excessive packets coming from certain source, and it can block it. But if you have this scenario, how can you block it? There are, these could be genuine users coming from all over the world. But at the same time, like you are expecting, let's say, 10,000 users at the same, to be concurrent at the same time, and suddenly you get 1 million users. Of course, your server will basically crash, unless if you have some mechanisms in place to handle this. You get the idea. This is an example scenario. But we will see this in much more details later on. Okay, so now we understand what security is about. It is basically protecting from harm. And we understand what are, what are we trying to protect. Three things. We try to protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Is clear? Okay, now what are the mechanisms? What are the tools? What are the controls? What are the safeguards we can do to protect those three properties? Okay, so for example, if we take confidentiality, how can we protect confidentiality? Encryption. And encryp encryption is one way, yes. Encrypting the data when it is transmitted through the network, uh, we encrypt it. So even if somebody taps into our network, eavesdrops the, on the network and get the packets, they will not make any sense of them because they, they are encrypted. And that's why we will spend considerable time in this course talking about encryption, not only talking, but also practicing cryptography. Uh, what other mechanisms to, to preserve confidentiality? <clears throat> Very good. We have some authentication. Before we allow people to access something, we ask them who you are. We want to know who you are. We establish your identity. And then we, we have authorization policies to say, depending on your role, whether you have access to that piece of data or not. Okay, so, so the first thing to preserve confidentiality, as we will spend a lot of time on this, is to encrypt the, exchange, the, the messages that are exchanged, and if there is an attacker in the middle, even if they get a copy, it's useless for them, they cannot decrypt it because they don't have the, the key. And this is a whole, we spent three, four weeks just on this. The, other tools is the authentication, establishing the user identity before allowing them to access some system or some data. And this could be done various ways, traditional uh, password, something that you know, or something that you are, such as fingerprints or eye finger. Um, or it could be something that you have. It could be a card. Uh, smart card with a secret key. So there are various authentication mechanisms and further details we will dig into them later on. Other tools for, for preserving confidentiality is access control and authorization. So once we establish identity, usually uh, users are assigned to roles and then these roles are given permissions and privileges. So once you log in, the system knows who you are, it knows what is your role, and based on your role, it will allow you or deny you access to some data and, and services. Now, for integrity, how do we protect integrity? Integrity being not allowing unauthorized change. Again, authentication and authorization. And also encryption could be used. Okay? And signing. So... We will see the difference later on between the encryption and signing. Uh, so the, at the end of the day, some crypt, cryptography tools to uh, help you to preserve integrity. There is also uh, uh, tools out there, especially at the network level. Uh, we call them intrusion detection systems. So these are specialized tools that monitor hosts within your network or, or the network traffic and try to detect malicious access or malicious 
uh, activities within your network. So those are the main uh, those are the main uh, tools. So we have prevention mechanisms and we have detection mechanisms. Prevention is we try to avoid it in the first place by putting access controls and authentication and access control. And then we have detection mechanisms because we, somebody might bypass our authentication and authorization and still get into our system. So we want to detect their presence uh, by... No, those are not detection mechanisms. Sorry. Those are prevention. Yeah. So in prevention, I have authentication access control, and I have message sign-in and encryption. And these, of course, we will spend time on them. The detection, a detection mechanism usually using an intrusion detection system. To, uh, and these intrusion detection systems, what they do is they first spend some time in your network, this, this intrusion detection systems, spend some time on your network and try to study the normal behavior. For example, how much bandwidth particular type of users use every day. There is some average. Uh, maybe as faculty, how much you use, as a student, how much you use. And suddenly, we see from this particular type of user, there is a big spike of usage. Maybe we can maybe raise some alert. Maybe something suspicious is going in here. Sometimes they do, they look at the packets that are traveling to the, through the network and maybe check the contents of the packet against certain database of known, known viruses and known attack strengths. Uh, so this whole area of intrusion detection and prevention, hopefully we will spend some time on this as well. But for now, just keep in mind, to preserve integrity, we have prevention mechanisms and we have detection mechanisms. And finally, for preserving availability, there are two, mainly three ways. Three ways we can do this. First is to have redundancy. If we want our, our system to be available and with high availability, we have to have multiple copies of, of major important services. So, for example, we have a, uh, if we have a web server, we might have multi, a cluster of servers, multiple servers, if one goes down, the other is available. Uh, same for mail, D DNS server, even for network. We can have multiple links to service providers. If we have multiple ISPs or uh, telecommunication providers, we can get two, let's say, two internet connections. In case one goes down or attacked or over flooded, we can switch the, to the other one. So redundancy is one way of increasing availability. The other one is using a firewall. Um, firewall is basically all the traffic going in or out the organization goes through this firewall, and this firewall has some rules. These rules, they can, they can either allow packets to travel or they can drop the packets. So you can say, for example, for denial of service attack coming from one particular host, you can put some rule. If, uh, the number of packets received within a particular time exceeds certain threshold, then block that source, for example. Or, so the firewall is nothing but, it could be a, like hardware or software-based firewall, and all the traffic goes through the firewall. The firewall analyzes it and applies some rules. If, there, if, if, if one of the rules is violated, that particular packet coming, or going, coming in or going out will be, will be dropped. And then we have also intrusion prevention and intrusion detection systems. So the, these are the three mechanisms. Again, in here, I'm just introducing the big picture. We will dive into some of these controls and some of these mechanisms along, along the course. Okay. Well, this is to summarize very quickly. These are the tools to achieve CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. For confidentiality, we have... Uh, encryption and access control and authorization. For integrity, we have prevention mechanisms such as signing messages and authentication and authorization. And we have detection mechanisms such as intrusion detection systems. And for availability, we have to preserve availability, we have to have redundancy. 
just in case a server is compromised or a service is compromised, we can switch to another one. And we can also deploy intrusion detection and prevention systems uh, to basically detect, for example, denial of service attack and try to do something about it. So this is the overall what security is all about, is we try to preserve this CIA, these three properties, and we have some mechanisms to do this to preserve each of them. So to be a security professional, you really need to gain some knowledge and skills on, the, on those control mechanisms and these detection mechanisms. And of course, also you need to wear the hat of the attacker and try to do it yourself to really understand what, what, is the, what are the tools at the end of the attackers and what they can do to really be, you, to re, to be able to, def to better defend your system. You really need to learn how the attackers really do their attacks. And that's, that's another part of, uh, of security. And in this context, we call it ethical hacking. We still do hacking, but not for the purpose of causing harm, but for the purpose either of discovering vulnerabilities in our, in our system or learning how these attackers mount their attacks. Here is the uh, threats or attacks on those, on those properties. It's not always from the outside world, from attackers. It could be bugs in our system, poor implementation, as you, as you mentioned. It could be an insider attack. So it could be external or internal. It could be malicious, which is with bad intention, or it could be accidental. So you're absolutely right. But in most, it's usually it's a shared responsibility, usually. So there are some weaknesses in the system, some lousy implementation, not enough testing, uh, not enough, uh, not good configuration of the servers and, and the network and so on. At the same time, so it's a combination of things. It's not only one source. That's what makes it hard. The sources or the threats that can threaten those properties can come from multiple sources. Yes? Even from developers themselves. Okay, so just for us to really uh, understand a little bit more and put this in a small scenario. So let's go through these small scenarios and just identify what is, what is being compromised here. What aspect of security or what property is being compromised. So for example, here Ali logs in into Fatima's Facebook and posts a photo. This is an integrity. This is an integrity attack. Basically, this is it could be putting some inappropriate content or posting. It could be uh, in other scenarios defacing the app, the website or posting inappropriate content. So this is to do with integrity. Second one, Steve's. Uh, like kind of sniffs traffic network on that is like let's say financially that is transferring financial information and based on the information they learn they can decide whether to keep this this Apple uh, stocks or to sell them so basically they trying to this is breaching the confidentiality so accessing Trying to, uh, try, trying to access unauthorized or confidential information to use it for their own gain. Um, Jenny forges a request to Banner to change her computer security homework grade. Integrity. This is an integrity attack. Okay. And Ali Talih causes power, power system to fail, taking the submission server offline. This is availability. Okay. So these are example scenarios just to show you which property is being compromised. And sometimes attack could compromise multiple properties. But these are just examples to further uh, illustrate these concepts. Okay. So now that we understand, now that we understand what security is all about, what are the properties that we care about that we want to protect, which are CIA triad, then we really need to start looking into some common terminologies that uh, cybersecurity professionals use. Uh, and even when you are reading or you are 
discussing with, uh, in the security context, you are familiar with those. Some of them we already used in our discussion so far, but let's see them in a little bit more details. So this diagram nicely summarizes them, like all the big terms that you will hear in this, in this area. So there is a threat agent, and this threat agent causes some threats. And these threats exploit vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities lead to a risk. And this risk can damage assets. And this damage can be countermeasured by putting some safeguards or some controls. And these safeguards make it so hard for the agent to do the attack. And this is an ongoing cycle. This, this is the cycle of security. By the way, security is not, luckily, as a security professional, you don't run out of job. You don't just come in, you say, I'll make your system secure, and it will never see you again. That doesn't, doesn't work that way. It is an ongoing cycle. The threats and the vulnerabilities are always renewed. They are always, like, new ones appear. Uh, like, and these vulnerabilities could come from any level, from any layer in your, in your system. It could come from hardware, from software, from the operating system, from uh, database components, even from uh, applications that we normally use, like, for example, PDF or Outlook or Office. That's why we always have some patches that we have to download and install to fix security issues. And this is ongoing. We might be using some vulnerable components we don't know about, but after a few, few weeks or few months, somebody will discover some vulnerability. So it is an ongoing cycle, an ongoing kind of battle between defenders and attackers. So let us go through a little bit more details what these terms really mean, each one, one at a time. Yes? Okay, so let's start with an asset. So the first term that you will always hear, um, you will always hear in the security context is the concept of an asset. What is an asset? I think it's an, like an abstract to describe uh, any system? Any system or, or a part of a system or a component in a system. Something that you're trying to protect. An asset is basically something that you are trying to protect. It could be a database, it could be a server, it could be a network, anything of value that you're trying to protect. That's what an asset is, yes? Now, associated with the asset is something known as vulnerability. What, is the, what, what vulnerability means? These concepts are very important, by the way. Don't <laughs> underestimate them. You really need to understand them very well. Vulnerability is basically, in a simple term, is a weakness. Some kind of weakness in your system that enables attackers to come and attack your system. That makes it feasible for attackers to uh, uh, compromise your confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That's basically what a, what a, a vulnerability is. Now, we have an asset. These assets have vulnerabilities. Then, what is a threat? Anything, anything from, anything, it could be outside attacker, an insider, that could take advantage of these vulnerabilities and come in and cause harm and compromise your confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Yes? Now, are these threats all the same? How we can differentiate between these threats? Some of them are based on the likelihood of, being, of happening. What is the likelihood of this threat happening? And what is, the, what is the second question we ask when we look at the th threats? Very good. Yes. So basically, what are the possible impacts of this threat if it happens? So these two aspects which is the likelihood plus the impact, if we put it together, what do we call this notion? The risk. So the level of risk is, based, is assessed based on two things. What are these two things? How likelihood and impact. The likelihood and the impact. Okay, is clear? Now, for example, let me give you a small example. If I have a small blog, I post some... Uh, definitions of this security and maybe some thoughts 
this is one one system, one online system. And I, there is, let's say, something like Al Jazeera. Which one has more likelihood of being attacked? Of course, it, is, it has much more, there's much more, uh, there are more enemies. I don't have many, as many enemies as, as Al Jazeera, for example. Okay. And also, in, this is in terms of likelihood. So this system has much more likelihood of being attacked because of the asset value. My little blog, maybe five, six people care about it. And but Al Jazeera, it's a big, va- it's, it's a value asset. Many people either Many people, okay? they, could, they are just trying to take the, uh, see the opportunity to, to come in and cause some harm. You get the idea. Now the impact. Let's look at the impact. If somebody comes and compromises my blog and puts some inappropriate content, okay? uh, they will say, okay, um, anyway, some inappropriate things. And imagine the same thing happens to Al Jazeera. Somebody comes, goes in and puts some fake news or deface, puts some inappropriate content. What is the impact? M- major impact. It will be there in everywhere. CNN headline. But I don't think my blog will make it even to uh, Doha News. You, you get the idea. So here... To really assess the risk, you have to look at the likelihood of happening and the impact. Now, when you do that, just to summarize it very nicely, you see this one is very nice, very nice uh, example here, not example, a tool to, uh, to really assess the risk. What you look at, you look at the likelihood. Is it it's very low or very likely? And by, by the way, this likelihood depending sometimes on some context, depending on some outside, outside events. For example, after, let's say, after the embargo on Qatar, for example, there, is, there are more attacks than before. There are much more attacks than before. And also, you, when you look at the consequences, you can see here they could be very low to very high. So you can have some, some kind of scale. You can say, what is the likelihood? You give scale from one to five. What are the consequences? You give scale to one to five, and you plot them into a matrix like this. And where should you focus first? On the red area. Very high likelihood and very high impact. Those you should invest more into, into control mechanisms to avoid those, those potential attacks. And then you move into the middle one, and if you still have some budget and effort, and you can try to convince your management to invest in protecting the law. But I don't think, if you, you are lucky to reach the middle ground, okay? So that's basically the, the importance of this. Uh, which, bring me, which brings me to, so these risks can damage, if they happen, they can damage assets. And we cannot just, uh, stay like close our arms and like wait for things to happen. We have to do something, and this this is what is known as guards or controls. We use control mechanisms to e- to prevent those threats from from happening. And those control mechanisms they are not free. If you want to put a firewall, you have to go and buy maybe the software or the hardware. You have to get some professionals to configure it for you, maintain it. So these controls are not free. So when you decide the controls, when you decide the controls, you have to look at the, at the risk. For high risk, and you have to highlight the risk to the management to tell them this is a high risk, a high impact. You better invest in some controls to protect yourself. In, in low one, in, in, a, in, in a threats that have low risk, low likelihood, and a low impact, you might just can survive with that risk. You cannot have 100%, 0% risk or 100% confident. You know, every day we do, we do actions and activities that has risks, but we have some acceptable level of risks. Like a car, there is a risk. If you take an airplane, there is a risk. But 
But that risk is you, you, there is an acceptable level of risk because you have you have takes you have taken some measures to control or reduce the risk. For example, in the car, you put seat belts. You try your best to follow the speed limits, uh, to follow the, the rules of the, the rules uh, of the road. In the aeroplane, they invested so much in uh, redundancy, multiple engines, and lots of uh, mechanisms to increase safety. But at certain stage, there will always be some, some level of risk. But that level of risk is acceptable. If it's not acceptable to you, then you can just walk. And even walking, it has a risk. So life is all, there is a risk, but we try to reduce that risk to a level that is acceptable. Yes? Okay. So to summarize very quickly, an asset is something that of value, very good, something of value that you want to protect. Um, for example, your, your financial or private, or private data. Vulnerability is a weakness that the attackers will take advantage of to come and harm your, uh, your CIA. Remember, CIA will always stay with us. Uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are examples of vulnerabilities in a computing context. context. We have unpatched applications. This is, don't underestimate this, because let's say Windows, or uh, like, uh, let's say, Office, or, 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 uh, or uh, Adobe, or some software that you are using, uh, the vendor will publish in their website, we find this vulnerability. You better hurry and, and uh, patch your system to protect against attacks. Now, you as a defender and the attacker, you are on a race. If you are not acting quickly, they, ca they can take advantage of this vulnerability. So, and this is, this is known as zero-day attack. Very dangerous. Because the, the vulnerability is known and public. The patch is there. You have to really be quick and fix it. Otherwise, you are opening yourself to this zero-day attack. It's just a matter of somebody coming and using that vulnerability. So this is very dangerous vulnerability and patch applications or OS. And example vulnerability and restricted access point. Access point, anybody can connect to it. Once they connect, they are inside your network and they can sniff packets and basically compromise your confidentiality and integrity. So when you are trying to identify vulnerability, you can ask your, yourself these two questions. So how is the system potentially affected by a threat? How can my system be compromised, basically? And what are the weaknesses that enable this threat to become a reality? And they be, they, these threats can come and compromise my CIA. So these are the questions you might ask to try to identify the vulnerabilities. Now, threats is anything that can come and exploit a vulnerability. That's what a threat is. So any possible danger that can come and compromise CIA, uh, it, the threats could be malicious or accidental, or it could, they could be external or internal. You need to be careful. So not like in the attacks and the threats don't always come from outside. They could be from an insider. So how to identify the threats you ask yourself again, how can, how can my system be compromised? Um, what are the ways, what are the ways the attackers, either internal or external, they can, what are the ways they, the attackers can come and try to reduce or compromise this CIA? You see, we always come back and use this CIA terms. They are very, very important in the, in the security world. Now that we have a threat, these threats are not the same level, okay? They have different likelihood and they have different impact. So when we identify threats, then we study the level of risk they, they expose. And this risk based on these two aspects, as I discussed, the likelihood and the impact. For example, if I have a firewall and it has too many open ports, anybody can come in, I am the likelihood of somebody tapping and going into my network is higher compared to I close all the ports 
maybe except port 80, the, where the web traffic goes, and maybe the port for the email. A couple of ports that I really need, and I close all other ports. You see here, so if, I, if anyone, like somebody, uh, email ITS, I have an app that uses some ports, please open these ports for me. They will not do that for you, okay? So because the more ports they open, the more vulnerabilities they, they create. Uh, another example of uh, if you have a, if you don't have a strong password rules when you when users create an account you don't force them to choose a strong password then basically you have a more likelihood of your passwords and your users accounts being uh, compromised because you don't have a, a, a strong policy a strong password policy so so the likelihood and the impact determine the level of risk. Now, the level of risk is very important to study, as I explained, because when you start putting controls or putting safeguards to protect yourself, you have to justify. When you go to the business and say, we want to buy some new equipment or hire a company to come and do some uh, ethical uh, do some penetration testing, find vulnerabilities, and this is how much it will charge, business will not be convinced unless if you highlight to them the level of risk. You highlight to them the likelihood of these threats being hap happening and the impact if they happen. So this is a way basically to convince business to invest in, in, in security. Yeah? Now, controls. This is what we have been discussing before this. Controls are all the measure, countermeasures, safeguards that we can, we can implement to either close a vulnerability, we close vulnerability that we know, or reduce the risk in order to protect our CIA. At the end, we, remember, we always keep the goal in mind, protecting our CIA. So these are example controls. Uh, strong password management, firewall, intrusion detection system, access control, encryption, security awareness training. So sometimes not all controls are technical. Not all controls are based on encryption and, uh, and uh, firewalls and so on. Sometimes it could be non-technical, such as security awareness training, just for users to be aware. They don't share password. They use strong password. They change passwords every period, 90 days or 30 days, whatever. You see what I mean? So when... If you want to identify the controls, you say, these are the questions you ask yourself. How can I close the vulnerabilities to reduce the threats? What are the protective measures I can put in place to make my system less vulnerable? And by the way, controls, this is very important sentence. Controls should be proportional to the risk, okay? It doesn't make sense for my blog, little blog, I maybe post, put one blog per month, and I will hire a company to do penetration testing and put the latest firewall, and it doesn't make any sense. It has to be proportional. But if you sell me something Al Jazeera, and you tell me, yes, periodically we will engage some uh, consultant to come and do penetration testing, highlight vulnerabilities, put firewall, put... it is convincing. Why? high likelihood of attacks because of high value asset and impact is high. Then, the, I mean, the, it is, uh, so basically the control should be proportional to the risk. That's what this, uh, this really means. Okay, so let's take a concrete example from real life. Let's forget a little bit about the, Let's forget a little bit about the security, like the computer security. Let's just take a, an example of a, a cat and a pen. You know, cat, they love pens. So let's now try to highlight the threat. What is the threat in this scenario? We have basically a cat in the home, and we have a pen that I use. This pen, for example, is very more valuable than the other ones because the other ones I can find easily. This one, if I lose it, I have to go and order another one. This is for writing on the screen. So what is the threat in this scenario? 
So the cats can come and chew on the pen, damage it. Okay. So it's when it's damaging. It's what type of what type in terms of security terminology? What type of uh, threat is this one, or what type of attack is this? Is this confidentiality? Is the cat going to? Uh, is going to re like kind of take some uh, secret my secret information and release it to other cats. They he had a nice pen. Come and attack it. So this is when it's true on the on the pen. What it's doing? It's an integrity. It's uh, basically compromising the integrity of the pen. When I come and use it, I, it might not be work because it has some buttons here. but some button here as well. It might not work anymore. Okay, what else? What other threat the cat can, can have on the pen? In what way? She can put it under the fridge or under the carpet, and then I'll have be looking for it like crazy. So it can threaten the availability of the pen. It can threaten the integrity. It can threaten the availability. Is clear? Okay. This confidentiality doesn't make sense in this scenario. Yes? Now, what are the vulnerabilities in the pen that allows the cat to do this mis this, uh, this harm? Very good. The pen is light and it's kind of uh, attractive and pl playful. Yeah? It's light. What else? Easy to manipulate. <laughs> Easy to manipulate and it's playful to, mani to play to manipulate. So these are the vulnerabilities of the pen. You, you get the idea. If so, here we have a threat coming from the cats, threatening the integrity and the variability of the pen. And the, there are some vulnerabilities in the pen enabling the cat to do this and to threaten the integrity and the variability. Now, should I just? Stay there and watch my pen threaten, or should I take some control measures? Control measures, okay? So what can I do? What are the control measures I can do to prevent the cat from threatening the availability and the integrity of my pen? Put it in the drawer, put my pen in the drawer, and the little cat will no longer be able to access the pen. But in here, there's a little bit of inconvenience for me the availability of the pen is now reduced. Every time I have to need, I need to use the pen, what should I do? Go to the drawer and get the pen. Yeah? That's one availability. It's a bit harsh, but that, that's one measure, yes. But, but in real world, this is not always feasible because this is just an example of a cat. What if I have the, the cats of the whole... Let's say I have some objects outside the home, the cats of the whole area. I cannot uh, to kick them all out. Or in the real world, I cannot go and get all the hackers and lock them up or kick them out to another planet. I cannot do that. So, yes, it, it could be. Yeah. Any, other con any other control I can do. So one way I can hide the pen in, in the drawer, and whenever I use it, I give the cat another toy to get away. Very good, yes. This is good. Like even in security world, there is something called honeypot. It's a, like a, a fictitious or virtual not, uh, system. When the attackers, they are so uh, kind of excited and so uh, uh, kind of they feel that they achieved something, they are attacking, but this system is not a real system. Okay, this is called honeypots, and organizations use it to understand how the attackers mount their attack and to understand their motivation and their behavior. So studying the, the mentality of the attacker through these honeypots. Yeah, what else I can do? It could be as simple as bringing like a cup holder, like a pen holder, and put it, put it with other cups, with other Pens, and this will reduce significantly the threat while it preserves the availability. So you, you, you see this scenario. I hope it helps you to really understand what's going on here. So here is the, this is the threat. Denying availability by kicking the, the pen under the fridge or affecting integrity by chewing on the pen. 
and the vulnerability is the small size than the lightweight. Now, in terms of controls, these are the controls I can do. Another one we didn't think of, I can make this pen big, so the cat cannot, uh, cannot, cannot, hold, cannot threaten it. But of course, this doesn't make sense because the trade-off, the usability of the pen will be, will be, will be uh, reduced significantly. Yeah? You see here, there's a trade-off. This, this example is very nice because it shows you the trade-off. Yes, this mechanism, I can do it. But what is the trade-off? What is the price I will pay? The usability will be significantly reduced. The pen will become useless. Another one is to secure the pen in, uh, by putting it into a drawer. This is nice, but it will reduce the availability of the pen. Other one I can do is prevent the cat from taking the pen. Every time it comes, I will say, no, go away. Don't, don't come near the pen. Or as, uh, as you said, kick the cat all, all together, not to come near the house or the, near the room. Or this is basically the best one. You just get uh, a coffee cup holder or pen holder and put the pens there. So you reduce significantly you reduced the, the threat significantly while preserving the availability. So the pen is just beside you. You can pick it up anytime, but the cat is much harder for her to pick it and play with it. So that's basically the idea here. And what I wanted to highlight, very important fact, that the controls can negatively impact your system, the quality of your system. Uh, some controls can negatively impact even the availability, sometimes the performance, sometimes even the, the usability of your system. So, for example, just to make banner secure in our context, just to make banner secure, the whole department, even the head of department, don't have access to banner to, to change something. So, for example, students ask me, can you please increase the capacity of certain course? I cannot do it. There's only one person in the whole department that can do it, which is the secretary of the department. Yeah? So this is causing inconvenience. Uh, this is uh, reducing the availability. Yes, it is increasing the integrity of the system, but what is the impact? It's reducing the availability of the system. Sometimes you might think, oh, I will put the highest possible encryption with big key, but what is the price? the performance will be reduced because the, there is computation overhead of the encrypting and decrypting. So you need to be careful. You pick the control, have a look at this. Select controls that are effective with fewer side effects. Yeah? Same is, for example, in the doctor case. They, there are many alternatives when somebody has some uh, illness, some virus. There are many medications or many procedures the doctor will take. But they always try to take the one that is effective with the least side effects. Same thing. In the security, you take the least, uh, the controls that have the least side effects on, uh, on other quality. Because the, soft, the system does not have only CIA. It's not only confidentiality, integrity, and availability. There is also usability, performance, and so on. So you don't want to overdo it, basically, at the expense of other quality aspects. Is this idea clear? So there is a trade-off. Uh, there is a trade-off. The other thing, the other thing I want to highlight: uh, in many cases, you cannot make the system 100% secure. There will always be uh, some level of risk, but you need to make it just enough secure to reach a level, an, acceptable, an acceptable level of risk. And I gave you the analogy of driving a car. There is always a risk, but we take some measures to reduce that risk, and we move on. But we cannot just say, let's just take this risk without any, counter, any safeguards or any countermeasures. It's just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah? Okay. These are some other examples, like, for example, here, uh, is another example beyond the cat. Here is an example from real world. You might have 
some private photo on your mobile. This is an asset that you care about. And the vulnerability could be a, a bug on the system allowing others to maybe remotely access your device and uh, threaten and steal your, your private photos, for example. So this is an example of what is the asset, what is the vulnerability, what is the threat. These are other examples here. Uh, so for example, for hardware, the hardware could be stolen or disabled and deny access to it. So you are reducing the availability or it could be the uh, a malware embedded into the firmware to, to, make, to reduce the integrity of the, of the system. In terms of software, somebody can go in and uh, hack into your system and delete some valuable software or misconfigure it and make it un unavailable. Or they can, uh, they can take an, auto an, aut an unauthorized copy of the software, and this is basically uh, compromising confidentiality. Or they can, do s they can modify the software without you knowing causing it to fail or causing it to, uh, to do some unintended task. For the data, some, someone can go in and delete the files or change access control to the files. or That is basically reducing the availability of the files. Or they can make a copy of the files and leak them uh, to some other people. Or they can go ahead and change the files or fabricate new files. So these are examples from uh, cybersecurity examples that affect availability, confidentiality, and integrity. So to summarize, this is basically the summary. The security is all, pro is all about protection from harm. That's what security is all about. And in the context of computer security, we are, we are trying to preserve these, system prop these important system pro properties, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And we do this by, by basically using some control mechanisms, some safeguards. But you should be aware that this safeguard has trade-off. There is a trade-off between security and functionality, maybe trade-off between security and performance, trade-off between security and usability. So you need to be careful here. So for example, in terms of trade-off security and, and usability, in Windows, whenever you, sometimes whenever you need to do something sensitive, it asks you to confirm, or maybe it asks you to log in again. It's annoying to you, but you have to do it. Uh, if you go to online banking, when you do a transfer, they will send you an, a message, you have to get the message and type it in. So it's reducing availability sorry, reducing usability for the sake of uh, security. But you, don't, you should not overdo it. You should try to find a good balance. That, that is the idea. Okay, uh, I, hope, I hope this gives you an appreciation about the area and about the course. Here I am just listing some resources that you might find useful. And... Throughout the course, we will go deeper into these aspects. But this is the roadmap. It's a very important to have a good understanding of these, of these concepts. Okay, thank you very much. The next time, inshallah, we will be starting to cover cryptography, which is one of the mechanisms to preserve confidentiality and integrity.